blow this town to smithereens. Time bomb. Try to get up there in time, Spider-Man. Don't be cut my web, Goblin. Watch yourself fall, Silk Slinger. Is this more action than even Spider-Man can handle? Welcome to the Fantasy Zone. Kyoto Animation, or Kyo Ani for short, is one of the greatest anime studios of all time. From popularizing genres of anime to having business practices that not many other studios acknowledge, they're in a league of their own. Whether you like the actual anime they have made or not, you have to admit that their technical work is impeccable when it comes to animation. Am I such a big fan of them that I had to binge everything they made? No. I even realized I haven't seen much of their works when I was looking for a list of all of them. I'm simply doing this video because I'm depressed and I felt like watching anime. Choosing to watch all 56 made by Kyo Ani was a spur of the moment thing. Also, these are not reviews, just my opinion. All that out of the way, let's watch some Chinese cartoons. Shio Asate Nani, or What is Happiness, is about this kid named Alto, who gets scolded by his teacher one day and has his first feelings of teenage angst. Until he runs into a mysterious kid who kidnaps him to show him he should focus on all the little things that make him happy instead of the ones that bring him down. It turns out this kid is an angel and after traumatizing Alto by whipping the fear of God into him, he learns that just being happy and giving someone a nice greeting with positivity is infectious and makes the people he comes in contact with happier. Honestly, I don't have a lot to say about this. It's a short 15 minute OVA with a good message for kids. If you have 15 minutes to spare, check it out. It's a nice humble beginning for the studio. Munto is the first all Kyoto animation production. It's a 50 minute OVA, but the first 20 minutes is all exposition from characters explaining the plot to someone that already knows what's going on, so the audience can keep up. I think this whole thing was an excuse for Kyo Ani to do some cool shots and animation. Despite the first 20 minutes being exposition, I was not invested that much in the rest of it. It's about these evil guys who need the energy from the Sky Kingdom that also exists in a different time and space, but also this guy. They're destroying it, so the king, the titular Munto, who is barely in it, goes down to our world to find Yumemi, a girl who is the only one who can see the sky world and holds the power to save them. I feel like the whole sky people thing didn't even need to exist. I was much more interested in Yumemi and her friends because the anime at least let us spend some time with them, and that segment had some interesting themes of not knowing what to do with your future, and having the courage to change a future already set for you so you can be happy. Every time I come back to the sky people, it was just a bunch of cool fights that I was not invested in. Half of it was good, but the other half bored me. This show is a spin-off, but also the second season, kind of, to the original Full Metal Panic. No, I will not recap or talk about the original. It's not on the list, it doesn't matter. All you need to know is it's about a guy named Sosuke Sagura, who was trained his whole life to be a military soldier for an organization named Mithril. He sends to Japan to watch over a girl named Kaname Chittery, but Sosuke being a soldier doesn't know how to live in regular society. Hijinks ensue. Also giant robots. Full Metal Panic Flamofu focuses more on the daily lives and comedic situations of Sosuke and his friends at school. The show was a mixed bag for me. Some episodes were really funny and had a lot of quick paced and well timed jokes, but others were slow and had mean spirited stuff in it. The second half of the first episode wasn't even aired in Japan because it involves the main character kidnapping a child. Who thought that was funny? Overall, I'd say I had a good time watching the show. The dynamic between Kaname and Sosuke I thought would get on my nerves, especially since she does the whole hitting him whenever he does something stupid thing that I never find funny. But at least it's justified here since he is constantly blowing stuff up and shooting guns. I thought the two bounced off of each other well, and my favorite bits were when it was just them alone. It's also cool to see cameos from some of the military characters from the first season. I'm glad they didn't overuse them and kept it to the school cast though. If you like slice of life comedies, then sure, give it a watch. I would say start at episode 2, unless you really want to see the sexual assault scene. Hilarious! I am not into dramas, especially the kind that are based on dating sims where a guy meets a bunch of girls with super moe energy and then he discovers they have some deep trauma or are gonna die or something. Not my thing. It's one of the reasons why I've avoided shows like this one for so long, because I knew it wouldn't interest me. 
He's just watching a guy hang out with a bunch of girls until he cures them of their troubles and then ditches them. Which, when I'm playing a game, that's fine, because I'm doing it. Just watching it is boring. I did enjoy the characters, even though sometimes they did push the cuteness too much for my taste. I'll admit, though, I'm not made of stone. Some of the backstories did get to me. My favorite character surprisingly turned out to be the protagonist, which usually never happens in these kinds of shows. I like the fact he wasn't some blank slate for the audience to project themselves on, mostly. He actually had a personality. Really, the thing that kept me uninterested was how dare the girls acted. Like, the main girl has some super kawaii noise she makes and is a klutz and acts like a kid most of the time. That does nothing for me. I'm also not a fan of those huge glass-eyed female character designs. Why are their eyes so far apart? Look like they're gonna fall off the side of their face. Unfortunately, when it comes to dramas, if I don't care about the characters, then I won't care about the sad bits that happen to those characters. The show was fine, it's just not my thing. So for some reason they made a sequel to Munto two years later, which I found weird because uh, the first one ended fine I thought. First I will say that the quality of this one is much better. The character designs and backgrounds look much cleaner, as well as the animation. I realized while watching this OVA why I wasn't so into the first one, because it feels like they're trying to tell two different stories. One is a coming-of-age story about a young girl trying to find her place in the world, and the other is a fantasy sci-fi war drama. Personally, I found the coming-of-age stuff more interesting because I actually got to know Yumemi and her friends, which made me care about them, and I wanted to keep watching them. Especially her relationship with her friend Ichiko, which I got really invested in. Like this moment when Ichiko realizes Yumemi is lost and unsure of how she can interpret these visions of the sky world that she's having, and Ichiko just screams her frustrations out when she realizes she can't really do anything to help her friend be there for her. That got me, man. That was a great scene. But every time it kept cutting back to the sky people, I was bored. Because it was a bunch of characters just expositing all this history that they already know to try to sell me on this world. But again, just feels like an excuse for Kyoani to do cool fight scenes. And yeah, they're cool to look at, but I don't give a shit about this shonen action anime they're trying to do, considering I think it's way better when it's doing the more quiet slice of life moments. The first 20 minutes of this one is just 20 minutes of a generic shonen anime that I did not care for, and the last half was all that good character relationship stuff I like. Also, I can only find the dubbed version of this, and some of the voice actors were for kids, which just made the whole thing funnier than it should be. And again, the title character is barely fucking in it. Why is it called Munto when it's not even really about him? It's like watching Naruto and having the focus be on the Ichiraku ramen guy. Wow, this was better than I expected. Full Metal Panic, the second raid, definitely stepped it up from previous seasons. Everything's better. The animation, the acting, the writing, the characters. I enjoyed most of it. I do have to go more in depth here than Fumofu, which means more work for me. This sucks. Like I said before, Sosuke Sagro was a child soldier all his life until he joined Mithril, a neutral mercenary organization that is dedicated to protecting peace with their ass, or arm slaves. One day he is sent to guard Konami Chittery, an ordinary high school girl who is actually a whispered, a person who has a bunch of military techno battles stored in their brains subconscious. Sosuke has to balance his life as a military boy while also living the life of an ordinary high school student to protect Konami. This season takes a lot of concepts for these characters and explores them very well. Sosuke gets some good character development as he now has to come to a decision about his future, whether he wants to just keep being a tool used by Mithril since he has protagonist powers, or if he wants to give it up and enjoy normal life with his friend in Japan. They unfortunately undermine this by basically him getting the best of both worlds at the end, but whatever, I like these characters so I'm fine seeing a happy ending. Konami gets some good moments here as well. In episode 9, due to what Sosuke is going through, she's basically left unprotected and is practically losing her shit over it, but she takes matters into her own hands and does a pretty good job at it. One of the best episodes of anime I have seen. The thing that carried over from Fumofu, which is apparently canon, is the relationship between these two. I love seeing them together, especially during the more intimate moments they have. How come, out of all the Kyo Annie scenes people talk about, no one brings up the haircutting scene from the second raid? It's fucking beautiful. It's a nice quiet moment between Sosuke and Konami that is told mostly through the animation. Just look at how Konami plays with Sosuke's hair. You can tell just by the animation how happy she is in this moment. I know it's KyoAni and me saying the animation is good, is redundant, but seriously. The action scenes here are just fun to watch. There's this whole chase scene in episode 5 that's a blast to see. Unfortunately, I didn't like everything. Like the villains. 
The main bad guy was so uninteresting. I describe his kind as a Joker wannabe, because he is obviously insane, has no regard for human life, kills his own subordinates. There's even a moment where he is apparently jerking off to a video of kittens? What? The twin sisters were fine. I got what they were about, but it felt like they needed more development and were both killed off rather unceremoniously. I also felt the side characters got the shaft. Mal was fine, but it really felt like Kurtz had nothing to do this season. Tessa got some development seeing how she's 16 in command of an entire military unit. It was about how she was still young and inexperienced, and you can see it weighs on her trying to live up to the expectations others have on her while they still treat her like a child. I can sympathize with that, but sometimes I was like, you're a fucking kid, why are you watching a dude getting tortured? Go to school! Also, the opening and ending songs sucked. They didn't fit the show at all. Overall, this is definitely my favorite KOA production so far. Seeing how they've slowly improved is amazing. You can only go up from here, right? Here we go, The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, a show that put Kyoto Animation on the map. It's okay. Kyoto is your average kid that no one understands. On his first day of high school, he is sat in front of Haruhi Suzumiya, a girl who wants nothing to do with ordinary people and wants to meet aliens, time travelers, and espers. After sparking the idea in her head to form a club, Haruhi forces Kion and several other of her schoolmates into the SOS Brigade, and it just so happens that the other students joining are an alien, Yuki Nagato, a time traveler, Mikuru Asahina, and an esper, Itsuki Koizumi. They all tell Kion that Haruhi has some mysterious reality-altering power that manifested years ago, and they were all brought together by her power because she wanted to meet them. And if Haruhi gets too bored or discovers she has this ability, she would probably Thanos snap everyone away and make a new world because this one bores her. What a great person. So for those that don't know, KyoAni decided when broadcasting the show to air them out of chronological order. I'm sure there is an interesting reason and story behind that, but I don't care. I'm just going to talk about the show's episodes in the order I saw them. The first six episodes are pretty much a movie, and ends with Kyoan telling Haruhi he likes ponytails, because he is a man of culture. Let me say, the first episode of the show is really good. Not the actual one, they are the real one. I especially like the writing of this show. Its dialogue is snappy and it never bored me once. Kyoan acts as the narrator throughout the series and hearing his sarcastic commentary is always hilarious. Then in episode 2, I remembered why I don't like Haruhi. Okay, this is an important show to a lot of people, so I'm going to put this gently so I don't upset anyone. Uh, she's an abusive sociopath. In episode 2, she sexually assaults Asahina. Not going to be the last time, by the way and blackmails the computer club, saying if they don't meet her demands, she'll tell people they try to gang-rape her. What a likable character. The worst part is that it's played for laughs when it's not funny, and the scene after that, Asahina is crying on the ground while silly music plays. I hate it! Also, despite being the title character, because of her reality-altering powers, Haruhi comes off less as a character to me and more of a plot device. The group will be doing some normal activity, but then they have to do some bullshit to make sure Haruhi doesn't get bored or upset, otherwise she'll blow up the planet. It's like watching them babysit the toddler. So these characters are basically just forced to hang around this girl and bend to her every whim. Otherwise, as they describe it, Armageddon happens, which she starts multiple times. Why do people like her? A lot of the episodes in Season 1 are one-offs, not really worth mentioning. I like the baseball one, the Full Metal Panic references and that cricket battle. And I saw those references to that Capcom classic Dino Crisis you put in that two-parter Kyo Annie, can't get it past me. And then... It happens. Endless 8. So season 2 of the show doesn't really continue the story, it's three stories that happen in the middle of season 1, and they rebroadcast the entirety of the first season with season 2 episodes spliced in. The only one-off was a time travel episode, it was good, but the next two stories are long, boring multi-parters. Like Endless 8. It's the same episode, 8 times, well more like 7 and a third. In this one, Haruhi, not wanting summer to end, traps the world in an infinite time loop. The last two weeks of August play out for a total of 15,532 times. That's about 595 years. And yes, you see the same day play out 8-ish times. With some slight variation in dialogue, and they animated it differently every time. Despite that, shockingly, watching the same episode 8 times-ish is fucking boring. I hated it. This story should have been three episodes max, but they did eight, and they had the balls to put fucking effort into it. The last story of season two is a five-parter that's three parts too long, titled The Sigh of Haruhi Suzumiya. The SOS Brigade film a movie for their cultural festival. 
that's it. It was boring, and I felt scenes dragged out more than usual in this one. Uh, what else? Uh, oh yeah, there was a part where Haruhi physically abuses and drugs Asahina, you know, all casual-like, and they just forget about it after like five minutes, and then she gets all pissy when Kyung calls her out for it. No bitch, you've been abusing this girl for months, you roofied her, and then you get mad when someone tells you you can't do that? Fuck you. And why does Itsuki always defend her shitty behavior with some bullshit speech about how special she is? She's constantly doing this shit. She goes too far but then faces no consequences because if they disagree with her, she'll bring about the apocalypse. Why do people like this character? We then get to watch the movie in its entirety. It's shit. Next is the cultural festival episode. Nothing of note happens. Next episode has my favorite joke of the show. <laughs> And the last episode is okay. And those are my thoughts on Haruhi Suzumiya. I know it probably didn't sound like it, but I overall enjoyed this show. This was mostly due to the voice acting, and you can't deny this anime looks really good, especially season 2. I don't like Haruhi as much as other people because she's an abusive cunt, but the other characters were fun to watch, and the writing and dialogue are all very well done. I kind of wish it was just a slice of life comedy show, because honestly anytime they did the supernatural stuff, I got bored and I felt it slowed down the pacing. Every single time it happened, the four main characters would have to have a minutes long conversation, explaining what Haruhi did subconsciously, what they're going to do about it, I don't care, go back to playing baseball. Honestly, I felt the same about Canon as I did with Air probably because it's based on a visual novel made by the same people. So I'm just playing my audio from that section. I am not into dramas, especially the kind that are based on dating sims where a guy meets a bunch of girls with super moe energy and then he discovers they have some deep trauma or are gonna die or something. Not my thing. It's one of the reasons why I've avoided shows like this one for so long, because I knew it wouldn't interest me. It's just watching a guy hang out with a bunch of girls until he cures them of their troubles and then ditches them. Which when I'm playing a game, that's fine because I'm doing it. Just watching it is boring. I did enjoy the characters, even though sometimes they did push the cuteness too much for my taste. I'll admit though, I'm not made of stone. Some of the backstories did get to me. My favorite character surprisingly turned out to be the protagonist, which usually never happens in these kinds of shows. I like the fact he wasn't some blank slate for the audience to project themselves on, mostly. He actually had a personality. Really the thing that kept me uninterested was how dare the girls acted. Like the main girl has some super kawaii noise she makes and is a klutz and acts like a kid most of the time. That does nothing for me. I'm also not a fan of those huge glass-eyed female character designs. Why are their eyes so far apart? Look like they're gonna fall off the side of their face. Unfortunately, when it comes to dramas, if I don't care about the characters, then I won't care about the sad bits that happen to those characters. The show was fine, it's just not my thing. Only one year after their smash hit of Haruhi Suzumiya, they made another anime classic with Lucky Star. What's it about? It's a show about nothing! How do we know when it's over? No, seriously, it's about a bunch of high school girls, and they do stuff sometimes, and they talk about stuff, and then they talk about that stuff again sometimes. That's it, that's the whole show. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I call this show good? I didn't think it was that funny. There's no real story or plot. There are characters. Animation's nothing special. Look, I'm really scraping to find something to talk about here. Again, not because it's bad. I think there's just not a lot going on. If anything, I only respect it for being a cultural milestone for anime fans, but that's about it. I honestly don't get why this show is so popular. It's because of all the references to other anime? Is this the family guy of anime? I am not into dramas. Especially the kind They're that are based, based on dating sims, dating sims where a guy meets a bunch of girls, with girls, super girls, super 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 and they just have to have a deep trauma, deep trauma. Deep trauma. So Clan Ad was okay, I didn't think much of it, but then Clan Ad After Story. Holy shit. This show decided to take my emotions and just beat the fucking shit out of them. I cried multiple times while watching this anime. People who have seen it know which parts and know why I did it. I still think this and Clan Ad didn't need to be 22 episodes each. There isn't enough going on in my opinion to fill all that time. The show was great though. Definitely the best of these key produced visual novel adaptations. Except... The ending. Fuck you. You take me on this emotional roller coaster that only in the span of a single anime episode 
tell me it didn't matter, hit the reset button, just fucking wipe away everything that just happened? Well, you can't wipe away my tears. I get it, visual novel, so you gotta show the endings. But you couldn't just pick a lane and then make the other ending a what-if OVA or some shit? Give me a tragedy or a romantic drama. I don't want both. That ending seriously ruined this for me. I felt like I wasted my time watching the last half. You made me cry like a bitch, and you fucked me like a bitch. Next is Sore o Miyageru Shoujo no Hitomi ni Itsuru Sekai. It's Moonto again. I mean that literally. The first six episodes are just the first two OVAs. I'm pretty sure it's the same footage. Then the last three episodes are like a third OVA? I don't know why they didn't just do a third one. And the last part of Muto is about the sky people, my favorite part. Nothing too amazing here to talk about. Fine ending to the story. Although they kind of sort of tease it'll come back, but not really. If you are curious and want to watch Muto, these nine episode TV anime is your best bet since it's the story in full. So these two shows are mini web spinoffs of Haruhi Suzumiya. They're fine. What, I gotta write a fucking thesis on every show I watch? k -On. This came out around the time I started getting into anime. I remember hearing about this show as it was very influential in popularizing the cute girls do X genre, along with Loki Star. This one revolves around the four main members of the Light Music Club as they go through their three years of high school. There is Ritsu, a drummer and self-instated club president who had the idea of starting the club in the first place, but her spontaneous and jerking, jerk, <laughs> but her spontaneous and joking personality clash with her best friend and bass guitarist Mio, who on the surface is a cool, mature person, but is actually very shy, anxious, and a huge scaredy cat. They are joined by Mugi, a piano-playing prodigy who, due to her wealthy upbringing, has a healthy fascination with normal, everyday things like going to a hardware store. She's also best girl. And Yui, the guitarist and protagonist who joins the Light Music Club thinking they barely play music, but becomes interested by their playing and decides to learn the guitar and join the club. They are later joined by their advisor, Sawako, who is an alumni of the Light Music Club and has a hobby for making cosplay. And a fifth member, Azusa, who is more serious with her musical studies, but eventually gets caught up in the girls' everyday lazing around. She's also a tsundere. The first season of K-On! is 12 episodes with two OVAs that I thought were pretty good overall. The first season I thought was very well written and had some good pacing and comedy, as it followed the first two years of the Light Music Club. Episode 2 stands out to me as probably one of my favorite episodes of anime of all time. For me to explain why it would have to be its own video, which I'm never going to make. Season 2, however... I did not care for. This season extended it to 26 episodes with one OVA for a total of 27, which was way too much. The pacing in the season felt really slow compared to the first. Not just because the first season condensed a year's worth of time into seven episodes, but because in season one everything felt tighter. In season one the writing and characters felt consistent, the jokes were quicker and funnier, but in season two episodes felt like they dragged on for too long and the jokes were way more spaced out and barely hit the punchline. Often during season 1 I laughed a couple times an episode, but season 2 I, I more often found myself watching it, they deliver a joke, and a few seconds after it I think to myself, oh that was a joke. The second season did have a lot more introspective moments due to it being the senior year of the main cast, so some episodes needed to be quieter and slower to really have these characters reflect on the fact that they are growing up and their lives were changing. However, I don't think that excuses the other episodes from being the same. Like, I feel like I should have found the episode where Mio has to participate in a tea party thrown in her honor for her own official fan club funnier. That premise with that character writes itself, but I found it boring. Overall, I would say k started off great, but I think due to the overly long second season, it goes down a few points for me. It wasn't bad by any sense of the word, just not as good. It gets a 7 out of 10. Oh wait, I'm not reviewing. I shouldn't be rating these. 7 out of 10. It's just Moonto again. I'll admit, since I'm not a huge fan of Haruhi and this movie has had its dick sucked by anime fans since it came out, I was going into this ready to tear it apart. Sadly, I can't, because this movie is really good. One day, shortly before Christmas, Kion wakes up and he finds that the world has changed overnight. 
Asahina, Nagato, and Koizumi are all normal people and have no idea who he is, and no one at his school has heard of Haruhi Suzumiya. The film follows him trying to piece together what happened and set everything back to the way it was without the usual help of his supernatural friends. What can I say about this that hasn't already been said? The animation is incredible, to say the least. The performances by the entire cast is amazing and keeps you captivated throughout with almost every word spoken. The writing is still as good, if not better, than the show. It's a fantastic movie. If you've seen the Haruhi show but haven't seen this, you need to. Even as someone who's not into the show, I can't deny this movie kicks ass. Did it really need to be that long though? Nijijou is a hilarious show, and you should watch it. It's one of the best anime I've seen, it's also one of the best manga I have read. That's all I can say about it, because there are only so many ways I can tell you this show is funny, and it will be redundant if every time now I keep saying the animation is spectacular and the voice performances are great, just assume they are from here on out unless I say otherwise. I don't want to say more, because for me to break down why this show is so good, I would have to pick some jokes and just explain them. I have like 40 other anime to watch, so I don't have that time, and we all know about explaining jokes. Let's go watch the show or read the manga, or at least check out clips on YouTube or something if you haven't already. You'll be laughing like crazy in no time. K on the movie was so fucking boring, dude. Two things happen in this film. The girls go to London, and they write one last song for Azusa. That's it. The movie is mostly just watching the girls dick around in London, which is expected of a show like K on, and I thought I would enjoy it because I like these characters. They don't do anything. They eat, they, they go on a Ferris wheel, speak English, nothing happens the whole middle of the movie. I know just watching them live life is the draw of this show, but it's carried over all the slower pacing and not funny jokes from season 2. The only times I can say I was enjoying it was the beginning when the girls were pretending to be the old light music club and act like they're having a falling out. That was funny. And the ending when the girls were playing the song they wrote for Azusa and were spending their last days in high school. It got me choked up. Unfortunately, the middle of the movie is uninteresting to me. Why has nothing felt the same since season 1? Oh god, I'm one of those people. <sighs> Look, I really tried to get into this one, man. I love mysteries. I'll watch a Detective Conan episode anytime, anyplace. Kyoka was really boring, though, with its mundane mysteries. Ricky is a guy that hates wasting energy. If he has to do something, it's probably going to be done fast and with minimal effort. At the request of his older sister, he joins a school's classical literature club to make sure it doesn't get disbanded. There he meets Eru Jitanda, a girl who gets curious at the slightest inclination of a mystery. Because he is unable to refuse her request, Reki uses his deductive reasoning skills to solve several mysteries the classical literature club encounters. First let me say, I don't mention the openings often, but the first one's calming tune mixed with the visuals is one of my favorite Kyo anime OPs so far. Speaking of the visuals, I love when they would use a different art style and techniques whenever someone was explaining a mystery or Areki was deducing something. It gave me a reason to actually look at the screen. Unfortunately, the actual mysteries bored me. I thought they would escalate eventually from why was the door locked? And why do people check out this book every week? And they kinda do, but I was never as curious as Chitando. Like, who cares why your teacher mixed up where you are in a lesson plan? I thought the one with her uncle would be cool and would span the whole show or something, but no, the characters talk about it and it's solved in like two episodes. Riveting. I'm not saying every mystery has to be a murder or supernatural to be interesting. I did actually like the bathhouse one and how Areki found out that senpai guy was smoking. The one about the film was pretty fun. But at the end of it all, I feel no satisfaction when the mystery is solved because it's mundane shit that I don't care about. Some would say that's part of the show's charm. Just a bunch of kids solving mysteries and living life. And if you like that, that's fine. I will pass. Is this the Scooby-Doo of anime? Yuta Togashi is a boy who, during junior high school, suffered from Chunibyo, believing that he possessed supernatural powers and calling himself the Dark Flame Master, therefore alienating himself from his classmates. Finding his past embarrassing, Yuta attempts to start off high school where he does not know anyone, free from his old delusions. This proves to be difficult, however, as a delusional girl in his class, Rika Takanashi, 
learns of Yuta's past and becomes interested in him. As the plot progresses, Rika becomes more attached to Yuta, who, despite finding her delusions irritating and embarrassing, accepts her. He helps Rika with a number of things, including founding and maintaining her club and tutoring her. The club in question, the Far East Magical Napping Society, Summer Thereof, also includes current Chinibio Sanai Dekamori, former Chinibio Shinka Nibutani, and the constantly sleeping Kumin Tsuyuri. Tsuyuri? I used the Wikipedia description for this because I don't have a lot to say about it. It's good. I liked it. I don't think anything really stands out that's worth talking about besides usual Kyo Ani phrases. Uh, except for the opening. It's legitimately one of my favorite anime openings of all time. Top tier shit. Well, here we are. Kyo Ani's first original anime production since Muto, I think. Tomoko Market. Did KyoAni use their new experience to make a great new original anime? Eh. Tomoko, what the fuck me. Kita Shirakawa, I think I said that right, is the oldest daughter of a family which runs the Tamiya Mochi shop in the Usagiyama shopping district. One day, Tamako encounters the strange talking bird, Dera Mochimazi, who comes from a distant land searching for a wife for his country's prince. After becoming overweight from eating too much mochi, Dera ends up becoming a freeloader in Tamako's home. The series follows the everyday life of Tamako, her friends, family, neighbors, and this peculiar bird. Wow, I need to keep using these Wikipedia descriptions. This makes my life way easier. I have noticed by this point, binging a bunch of anime made by one studio is not good for me. I've seen these slice of life that follow cute Kamoe blob girl shows before, but they hit differently when you're watching them months apart and you cleanse your palate with other anime of a season. Binging a bunch of them in a row is making me like them less and less every show. Take Tamako Market. If I watched this under any other context, I would say it is quintessential Kyo Annie. Since I'm watching these in a marathon though, it's just shit I've seen a million times already. The setting of this one made it feel different enough at least. Shopping market is a location I have not seen a lot in anime as a main setting. I know I've not talked much about the show itself, but it's just because it blends together with all the others I've seen at this point. I just need something different. Aw oh, yeah son, finally got rid of all those fucking gross girls. Boys watch K-On, men watch free. The story is centered on high school student Haruka Nanase, a gifted swimmer. After encountering his childhood rival, Rin Matsuoka, he and his friends were revitalized Iwatobi High School's swim team. In addition to his childhood friends Makoto Tachibana and Nagisa Hasugi, Rei Ryugazaki is recruited into the team. Okay, that Wikipedia entry sucked. They don't even mention Rin's sister Go, the best character and woman of culture. But yeah, Free is fucking awesome. I love a good sports anime, and this is the best kind to me. The sport is really just the backdrop and the attention is put on the characters and their relationships. Each member could be classified as a bishi stereotype because they are, but I think the show gives them enough development to make them unique enough. I loved every second my boys were on screen. The animation here is especially good. It's so nice to not just see some Moe Bob anime chicks and Kyoani try for a slightly more realistic style. The soundtrack is great. I'm in love with the opening and ending for various reasons. The story is also that nice amount of melodrama for me. Haruka and Rin's relationship with each other and how each character views swimming in general gets kind of philosophical. In conclusion, Free is great. Go watch it. Go for the beaches. Stay for those triceps. Okay, this is a recap movie. Some anime do this. It's basically a retelling of the original story, maybe with some new elements. I don't like recap movies. It's basically the first season in an hour. There's some new stuff, but it's mostly shit I've seen already. Bass. happened. A Kyoto animation show I don't like. One day, high school student Akihito Kanbara instinctively goes to save his fellow schoolmate Murai Kuriyama from committing suicide. Following his pleas, Murai suddenly stabs Akihito with a sword formed out of her own blood and is shocked to discover that Akihito is an immortal half-yomu, the offspring of a supernatural creature called a yomu and a human. After learning that Murai is a spirit world warrior specialist who protects humans from being affected by a yomu, and the last surviving member of her spirit hunting clan, their lives become intertwined as Akihito seeks to help Mirai gain the confidence to kill Yomu so that she may stop attempting to kill him. <sighs> so first, this show does a thing I hate. By starting you off with characters that all know what's going on, why is that bad? Well, you know an audience surrogate, right? A character who expresses the questions and confusion of the audience. 
it's so exposition can be delivered in a more natural way. Like Ray from Free is considered the audience surrogate. Here almost every character knows what's going on at the start, or I kind of doesn't, I guess, but she knows enough. So when people start expositing, I keep thinking, don't they know this? Or the opposite happens and they talk about stuff but don't expand on it, so I as an audience member am like, what exactly is a Yomu? What are these society and organizations that they're talking about? What is a spirit warrior? Why and how does this character do this thing? Obviously I figured out what was happening as it went on, but it was too little too late for me. I hate it when shows start throwing all their made up terminology at you with a half assed explanation. If it weren't for the fact that I was doing this video, I would have stopped after a few episodes. I also can't stand the main heroine. She's clumsy and has glasses too big for her and is socially awkward. All of that is trying way too hard to get me to like her, which makes me hate her. The main character is boring too, mostly feels there. Like if he was replaced or didn't exist, I wouldn't notice. The whole being a half demon or having a demon inside you thing has been done a lot, so there needs to be something to spice it up. The relationship between Akihito and Mirai does that, but I don't like either of them, so I didn't care. The side characters are generic. They all feel like light versions of better characters from other supernatural battle shows. A lot of their designs seem very generic to me as well, especially when they are next to Mirai, which looks like she comes from a completely different anime. Every time characters were talking too, it sounded like what they were saying wasn't as cool or important as they wanted it to be. When a character started talking about something serious and serious music would cue, something about the tone and directing made it feel too on the nose, like it was telling me too clearly that, oh this is serious, which made it feel more satirical to me. The only thing I can say I liked was the fight scenes, Kyo and A can still animate very well. I don't get invested in these fights though, because I don't like anybody, so I feel nothing during the big climatic moments. And I feel everything is so generic, the fight scenes remind me of the fake, over-the-top fight scenes from Chinibio. You know, the ones that are meant to be a joke. Everything else, I did not care for. At its best, I was bored. At its worst, I was uninterested. Season 2 is good. I didn't like it as much as the first season, but if you're a fan of the show, you'll like it just fine. Seeing Yuta and Rika's relationship develop is cute. It's rare to see an anime about a couple basically figure out how to be a couple. That's all I have to say. If you like the first season, you'll like this one. It's more of the same, but in a good way. Wow, I like this better than the show. It's a cute love story between Tamako and Mochizo, who I don't think I mentioned. And whatever, he's a cuck. The film follows the two of them as they come to terms with changes in their lives as they get ready for their life after high school and decide their futures, especially if they went one with each other. This film does what it needs to do and is a cute romantic comedy with some surprisingly sad and calm moments to let the characters reflect. If you like the show, I'll definitely like this. Good movie. So yeah, we're in an era of good sequels, I guess, because we got another banger. Let's go back to when I talked about Free. All that stuff applies here. This one is more focused on Haruka and what he wants to do for the future after high school, and if you haven't noticed from past shows I've talked about, I like watching characters get introspective about real situations like becoming an adult and figuring out their futures. I relate to that. Again, not much to say here. Good season. I'm excited to watch more Free down the line. Seiya Kaniya is a good-looking perfectionist boy who was forced by the mysterious Isuzu Sento to visit an amusement park named Amagi Brilliant Park, which is in serious financial trouble and about to be closed forever. The park is actually staffed by refugees from a magical realm called Maple Land, and the park is a facility for harvesting magical energy from visitors while they're having fun. As such, the park is the only way the refugees can maintain their existence in the human realm. To save the park from closing, Seiya is hired by the owner Latifa, Princess of Maple Land to become its new manager, and uses skills in entertainment to get 250,000 visitors in two weeks. And no, that is not Bonta from Full Metal Panic from Mofu, that is Moffle, you racist. The show is mostly a comedy, and a lot of it does land. Like I said with Nichi Joe, there are so many times I can say, this is funny, and this is not in an analytical breakdown of why the comedy works, it's just my opinion. The one area I think this show shines is his characters. Seiya being an overconfident cocky son of a bitch makes him fun to watch, but he has morals and ethics that keep him from going too far so he never turns into an unlikable asshole. I can also relate to his struggle. I too was a down as luck park owner at one point in my life. I played a lot of Thrillville. The employees at the park are great. Their designs themselves can just be funny on their own, but when you get the spotlight on one of them, they can be downright hilarious with all their personalities playing off of each other. Oh yeah, and that's a nice fan service if uh, that's your thing. Moggy Brilliant Park I would put in the good pile. Something special, it's nowhere near bad. 
So first off, I went into this pissed because I realized this was two movies. The first one titled Past is a recap of a show I don't like. I will admit I like it better in this Cliff Notes version, mainly because it was shorter and got to the point. The second one titled Future is a new story. It's fine. The problem is I don't care about anyone. I'm watching this film and I see all these characters crying and yelling. There's a lot of that in this film. I don't care, so I just look on with apathy. I guess that's on me and my tastes. I'm sure people who like this show think that this movie is great. To me, it's okay. I hope I don't have to talk about the show again. Hibikei Euphonium is not just my favorite Kyo Annie anime I've watched so far. It might be one of my favorite anime of all time. There are two reasons why I don't go into detail about these shows. I either think it's really good and want you to watch it without me spoiling something by accident, or it's just not interesting to me. This is one that is really good. It follows the Kataoji High School concert band as they try to go to nationals. I know that's a standard plot, but the best part about the show is their journey to get there. We watch this group of young kids who at first are very nonchalant and dismissive of their time in the band, barely taking it seriously, until their advisor uses his be a dick method and slowly motivates them to get off their asses and try, and you see them actually start to enjoy it. You watch these kids go from these regular lazy teenagers who just want to make fun club memories into true musicians who literally hurt themselves for their art, spending every waking moment improving. I love all the characters. Kumiko as a protagonist had to grow on me, but as I got to know her, I wanted to see her succeed. This was the first anime in a long time where it felt like I was watching actual people instead of a bunch of anime characters. Something about the way they were written and the relationships developed felt so natural. Just watching them go so far for their music even motivated me to keep striving and never settle for being just good at something. The animation of course is spectacular, specifically the backgrounds during sunset and night shots were beautiful. The music of the show is great, I love orchestral music, but my one nitpicky complaint would be I hated how we never got to hear the band play a song in full. Even the one in the final episode is chopped up and shortened, and I hated it because I watched these characters practice for months, and it would have been satisfying as hell to finish the season off with a big concert. I still cried like a proud parent when they got rewarded for all their hard work, but I would have liked a full performance. And I wouldn't have cared so much if it weren't for the amazing writing. I want to improve is what this show left me with, and I know there's more of this down the road, and I truly can't wait to see this group again and hopefully watch them make their dreams come true. Definitely a favorite of mine. So I like Free, but I don't like prequels. This is a movie about the characters from Free in middle school, and I don't care. I don't mind prequels if they're about new characters, but when it's about ones that already exist, I know what's going to happen in the future. This is pointless to me. The actual movie is fine. It's really just my own stigma for prequels like this. If you like Free, you don't care as much to me about prequels for characters we already know the futures of, then you'll enjoy it fine. Holy shit, I forgot this was a Kaolani production. In the near future, the accidental release of an experimental virus causes an outbreak that changes the brain chemistry of every person in the world, allowing them to perceive extra-dimensional beings called phantoms. In addition, some children born after the outbreak have developed special powers that allow them to battle and seal phantoms. Even though the vast majority of phantoms are harmless, many of these gifted children are placed in clubs, schools, and organizations dedicated to dealing with phantoms that prove to be nuisances or threats to humanity. The story revolves around Haruhiko Ichijo and his friends at the Phantom Hunting Club of 4C Academy, a private school for children with special abilities to seal phantoms and their everyday lives and struggles dealing with them. Wow, the Wikipedia description doesn't even mention the other characters. That's a red flag when an anime description doesn't mention the waifus. This one is worse than Beyond the Boundary, mainly because it's so nothing. At least Beyond the Boundary brought out an emotion from me, and after watching it, its recap movie had more original ideas than I gave it credit for, but this feels like the most textbook anime I have seen in a while. The main problem with this anime is there's nothing new done with the concepts it delivers. A bunch of high schoolers with special powers fight monsters with fan service. That's all it has. The writing is not great either. All I should say to explain that to you is in the first episode, the main character says, It's common knowledge, but I'll explain anyway. Which is the worst way to deliver exposition. The fights hold no weight either. It's just, there's a phantom. Go fight it. Sometimes they add personal stakes for the characters, but they're usually ineffective and uninteresting to me. The one thing I can say I actually liked about this show is the opening. It's a bop. 
Unfortunately, the rest of Myriad Colors Phantom World is a bunch of concepts that have been around for a long time, and in my opinion, it doesn't do anything interesting or different with them. When it tries to do something, it's predictable and underwhelming. Sixth trophy for my least favorite so far. It's another first season recap movie, which pisses me off. I was ready for a Hibiki Phonium movie jam. This movie's fine. Technically, it's really good. Acting, animation, music, and directing are all strong. Uh, I know I'm not giving you much here. Not because this movie deals with real topics and I'm trying to be sensitive. I'm not saying much because this movie didn't really do anything for me with those topics. I hate everybody. The main girl I think is too bland for me to care about outside of her being deaf and nice and I didn't care about the main character because all I knew about him is he bullied a deaf girl as a kid and now he feels bad about it because he became a scapegoat so the other boys get off scot-free. There's also some cliche stuff that breaks how otherwise realistic the movie is like the teen romance love triangle that I didn't think that was necessary or how a deaf girl for some reason still liked the main character despite how he bullied her and the last time she saw him, they got in a fist fight. Did I miss a scene explaining that? I don't care much about the characters, I don't get invested. So throughout this drama, when the sad music played and the more intense scenes happened, I didn't care. It was just a bunch of moving drawings to me. I rate it 30 out of 47. Season 2 of HBK Euphonium is just as good, if not better, than the first season. This season focuses a lot more on individual characters, both new and old, as the Kataji Band practices for nationals. It delves more into their home lives and interpersonal relationships as the characters struggle to balance them with their time in the club, how they will be dealing with unavoidable changes that life throws at them, and what making music means to each of them. This show has touched me, and not in a sexy way, in a I cried multiple times while watching it kind of way. It feels like this anime was made for me, and it honestly inspires me to push myself to achieve the things I want to do in life and have no regrets. I know some of you may say I'm taking this anime too seriously, but again, due to my own personal life, this show has resonated with me on a level even I didn't expect. I know you all have something like this too. Maybe it's a game, a movie, an anime, maybe one of the ones I shit on earlier. We all have these pieces of media that just resonate with us. For me, Hibuka Euphonium is definitely one of them. It's top 10 anime of all time for me. I loved it. A programmer named Kobayashi gets ready for work one day when she is greeted by a large dragon right outside her front door. The dragon immediately transforms into a human girl in a maid outfit and introduces herself as Toru. It turns out that during a drunken excursion into the mountains the night before, Kobayashi had encountered the dragon, who claimed to have come from another world. Subsequently, Kobayashi had removed a holy sword from Toru's back, earning her gratitude. With Toru having no place to stay, Kobayashi offers to let the dragon stay at her home and become her personal maid, to which she agrees. Unfortunately, Toru's presence attracts other dragons, gods, and mythical beings to her new home, bringing about all kinds of hilarious situations. Kobayashi's Dragon Maid is a nice slice of life comedy with some otherworldly stuff thrown in to keep her from being too mundane. The characters are all great from the dragons to the human characters. The show is also funnier than I expected, like a lot of the gags landed harder than I expected. Uh, then all the standard Kyo Andy praises apply. Another recap. How many of these are there? Is it three in a row? Stop wasting my fucking time. I got like 12 more anime I got one. So this OVA is great. You should watch it. It's only 20 minutes. It's adorable, funny, and has some really cool animation with Hyo and Annie going for a more sketchy style that I think suits them well. I just can't talk about it now because it filled me with the need for some Hamtaro back in my life. All the real niggas remember Hamtaro. In fact, once this video is done, I'm watching every episode of Hamtaro. I'll play all the games. This is a Hamtaro channel now. Free Take Your Marks is fine. I believe in too much of a good thing. Meaning that when I'm satisfied with an ending of something, then I don't need any more. And after Free Eternal Summer, I'm kinda done. Not that having more free is bad, it's just that I personally don't feel there is any more reason for me to follow these characters. I got all of their story I need. I'm emotionally satisfied. Eh, I'm sure bigger fans of this like it. To me, it was boring. I didn't care at all. One of Kyo Annie's weaker movies, too. I think it looks good, but I've seen them do better.
Violet Evergarden was a soldier seeing herself as a tool to be used by her commanding officer, Major Gilbert, to fight the war. One day, Violet wakes up after one of the final battles, finding herself separated from Gilbert, and is told that the war is over and he is declared missing and dead. Upon trying to integrate into normal society, Violet discovers auto-memory dolls, basically people who write letters intended to convey their feelings to the receiver. Seeing how dolls are able to convey strong emotions on paper, like the concept of love, Violet decides to become a doll so she can understand Gilbert's last words to her, which were, I love you. Man, you corny! First, this anime looks fucking beautiful. One of the best looking anime I have ever seen. The backgrounds are incredible and the character designs are amazing. Like, why is everybody in the show so hot? Everybody. Other than that, this show's pretty boring. It mainly follows Violet as she takes on different clients as a doll and... Through their own personal circumstances, she learns more about her own and others' emotions. I've said this before, if I don't like your characters, I won't like it, period. And Violet doing her best Yuki Nagato impression is so interesting to watch for me. I'm supposed to feel for her because she's a child soldier around 14 and because she's unable to understand emotions, but like her, I feel nothing. I guess the real Violet Evergarden was inside me all along. But even when they go into her backstory, I'm just like... Whatever, man, I get it. The only one you love is missing. You don't know how to process those feelings. Get back to writing letters. I'm glad she came to some kind of resolution by the end. It's not that she's a bad character. It's just I don't feel sad for her because she doesn't understand the concept of love. It's not sad to me. It's corny. The stories of the people she encounters didn't do anything for me either. I was always like, oh man, damn. That sucks, man. It's fucked up what life's doing to you, bro. <laughs> hey, shit, man. That's how it be sometimes. I think it's because we spend so little time with them. As soon as I started liking them, the next episode would happen. They were gone, and we were on to the next person. The show was trying to convey to us that human emotions are complex and can't always be understood no matter how hard you try to understand them. And if you're trying to explore a concept like that, don't give me 20 minutes of some cliche plot for a person I'm never going to see again. I don't think the show should have been episodic. Give me some multi-parters or story arcs so I can get as invested as Violet does, so I as a viewer can experience the same emotions on display. Let me be clear, Violet Evergarden technically is not a bad show, I just didn't like it. Remember when I said too much of a good thing? Yeah, I love Hibiki Euphonium, but I don't really care if there's more of it. Season 2 had a great ending, I don't need any more. We will get some anyway, like with this movie, Liz and the Blue Bird. The film focuses on two band members, Nozomi and Mizude, as well as telling the fairy tale of Liz and the Blue Bird as their friendship parallels the fable. It's a story within a story. Like a taco within a taco? A double deco taco supreme. So first off, I don't know why we're still on these two's friendship. I thought we got over that in season two. Yeah, it explores a new concept with their friendship that the two never considered until now, but I don't care. Until you get to the solo. That shit almost made me cry, dude. Almost. The rest of the film after the solo is great as well, as you watch these two come to not really a resolution, more of a this is how it's going to be for now. Good to see this still retain those amazing character dynamics from the show. In terms of animation, I prefer the style of this movie to the show. If we can combine the character designs from this with the backgrounds from the TV anime when season 3 comes out, then that will be animation porn for me. Overall, I would say I wasn't interested in it though. Listen the Bluebird gets some points from me, mainly because it's associated with a top tier anime, but ultimately I find stories focused on side characters unnecessary for me to watch. I hope the rest of PBK Euphonium is better. And it will be like a taco inside a taco within a Taco Bell that's inside a KFC within a mall that's inside your- <sighs> Yeah, I don't care about Free anymore. They did the same plot three times. I swear if the last of Free involves another kid from Harvest Past that he has some sort of a strange relationship with, I'm gonna be fucking- Minato Naramiya used to be in his middle school's Kyoto club, until a certain incident in his last tournament caused him to quit archery for good. When he attends high school, his childhood friends, Seiya Takahaya and Ryohei Yamano Yamanochi, try to rope him into joining the high school's Kyoto club again, but he refuses. However, an encounter with Masaki Takigawa at an archery range in a forest inspires Minato to take up archery once more. Mizuno joins his high school's Kyoto club, and along with his old friends and new teammates, they aim for winning the perfectual tournament. Ah, oh, I see what you did there. Sarune is a good show. It's a more relaxed, mellow take on a sports club anime. You don't really get excited or hyped for the matches or rivalries formed. Sort of like free, the actual sport is irrelevant, as the main draw is the character interactions. 
Minato I liked as a protagonist, as it tackles an angle I haven't seen in sports anime. The incident that that bad Wikipedia description was talking about was his mother's death after they were involved in a traffic accident. And due to a bunch of other shit, he became unable to perform at the level he used to. Seeing him overcome his trauma and slowly get back into archery is a heartwarming story that instantly made him likable to me. The other characters of the team, while we don't dive too much into them, have good characters and are fun to watch. And the ones we do dig deeper into actually had good reason for their yaoi melodrama. The female members of the club, though, did not make any impression on me whatsoever. Considering the focus is on the boys, I don't even understand why they were there. Sometimes it seemed like they would go more in depth into what they were about, but ultimately felt so useless I often wondered why they existed at all. Strangely as well, the animation I found lackluster. None of it was bad, but during other mundane shows like Yoka or Tomko, KyoAne would find some opportunities to do some sick sakuga, but here they animate the arrows nicely. That's it. Pretty standard in terms of animation for the studio. If you want a nice chill sports anime and free is too much for you, check this one out. I thought I would feel the same way about Hibika Euphonium as I did with Free, especially since Season 2 ended so strongly for me and I wasn't too into losing the Bluebird. I was like, alright, this movie is going to be nothing special, just a little extra something that's going to slowly kill my interest. But no, I love this movie. The film follows Kumiko through her second year of high school, dealing with more responsibilities with the club, freshmen, and her love life. For me, I think this film asks the question of, is all your hard work and effort going to be worth it? Sure, you could have the skill for something, but all the skill in the world won't mean you can achieve your goals. The thing you're trying to do is so competitive and there's always someone better, as well as all that skill can alienate you from others in various ways. Once again, the characters make this movie for me. It was great seeing all of them again, and seeing their relationships develop even more. All the new first years don't get outshined though. Both their designs and personalities are all unique and interesting, and you get a sense of what they're about right away. Especially Kanade, her attitude and how she goes around teasing others, especially Kumiko, made her very entertaining to watch. Everything else I have said about the past shows applies here. Yo, I love the performance they did at the end. Hearing the sixth solo from Liz and the Blue Bird again was fucking great. The ending of the film was actually perfect. I liked how they did it and set up further motivation for the eventual third season that was announced. He became Euphonium, still a top tier anime for me. Movie, top tier, can't wait for more. Remember when I said that those Violet Evergarden episodes needed to be longer than 20 minutes so we can get to know the characters better and develop them more? Well, as usual, I was right, because this movie is amazing. In this film, Violet is sent to a fancy royal academy to help Isabella York in her studies as she is underperforming and is suffering from a sickness. At first she does her best impression of an emo high schooler, but then you realize she actually has a reason to act this way, as she used to be Amy Bartlett and she only lives this life of a princess to please her shitty family, as they promise a better life for her adopted younger sister, Taylor, which she accepts, realizing living in poverty is no way to care for a child. After Violet writes a letter to Taylor for Amy, Taylor visits the main cast three years later to learn to become a male person so she can deliver happiness like she once got. Insert usual Kyo Andy praises. Like I said, the story works for me because we get to know these characters for longer than 20 minutes. Isabella started off as just being a cold and distant for no reason, but you come to like her as she realizes her and Violet have more in common with her past than she realized. Seeing their relationship develop was interesting to watch, and her reasoning for acting like she does to her classmates made a lot of sense when it was revealed. But I gotta say, my favorite part was the last half with Taylor learning to deliver mail, Violet teaching her how to read, that fucking ending, dude, I cried. First time one of these Violet Evergarden stories actually made me cry. Anyway, Taylor was adorable, and seeing her work hard so she can one day see her sister again, and convey her feelings to her, tugged at my cold and moving heart something fierce. Another thing this movie did was develop the world a bit more. They did this in the show too, but the time skip was cool as it allowed us to see how the world was advancing post-war. Like elevators are a new invention, just a little detail like that adds so much to the world for me. While you kinda have to have seen the show to understand some stuff, honestly I recommend even if you haven't seen the show, watch this film. Out of all the QoAnny films I've seen, this is top three for me. Wonderful movie, wish the show was more like this. So did anyone else play this game Ham Ham Heartbreak for the Game Boy Advance where you had to go around talking to other hamsters and fixing their relationships using your secret language? That game was sick dude. Funny as well. I played that all the time as a kid. Yo, who remembers the Ham Ham games? I- Oh uh, yeah, Bajo Studio 2. Or whatever, it was really good. Better than the first one. Remember that episode of Hamtaro where he became Santa Claus? Exactly like the Tim Allen movie? 
okay, why are the movies way better than the show? What happened? I can't really give a plot synopsis here because this movie is the ending to the series, which I don't want to spoil because it was really good. I actually cared about Violet here and felt bad for her in this film. I wanted to see her succeed and come to a happy ending for her story. I also really dig the world building. Remember how elevators were new in the last film? Well, this one they are building a radio tower which will give everyone phones, making dolls obsolete. It's so fascinating for me to see fantasy worlds do this stuff, watching characters react to new technology, especially when it's something that will impact them so heavily. I'm pissed now that this is the end of the story, because now I'm actually invested in this world and characters. But I do believe in letting the series end and not go on for too long, and this one did give a satisfying ending to Violet's tale. Well, here we are. This may be the last one I'm talking about. I'm currently recording this September 20th, so if I can't find a way to watch that free movie somewhere, somehow, this is going to be the last show I'm going to be talking about. Kobayashi's Dragon Maid S. Unfortunately, I don't have much to say, since it's the second season to a slice of life show that I'm only moderately into. Don't get me wrong, this season is arguably better than the first. All your favorite characters are back and just as lovable and adorable as ever, and the new characters are just as great. If I wanted to praise one aspect of the show, is that it is funnier than the first season. I'm not sure what specifically it is, the voice performances, the writing, the animation, etc. I think they are all done so well that they each add to the comedy of the scenes. I found myself laughing out loud multiple times an episode. I don't have anything bad to say about this season, really. I was laughing and enjoying it throughout its entire run, and if a season 3 is in the works, then I will be all too happy to watch it. By the way, KyoAni, are, are y'all running out of ideas for OPs now? Because the beginning of this one is just... The first OP of Nichijou. Do you think I wouldn't notice? Don't forget to subscribe!